Hello, everyone. Welcome to theCUBE's presentation of the AWS Startup Showcase, AI and Machine Learning, the top startups building generative AI on AWS. This is the season three, episode one of the ongoing series covering the exciting startups from the AWS ecosystem. Talk about AI and machine learning. Can't believe it's three years in season one. I'm your host, John Furrier. We've got a great guest today. We're joined by Joseph Nelson, the co-founder and CEO of RoboFlow doing some cutting edge stuff around computer vision and, and, and really at the front end of this massive wave coming around large language models, computer vision. The next gen AI is here and it's just getting started. We haven't even scratched the surface. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So you gotta, gotta love the large language model foundation models, really educating the mainstream world. Chat GPT has got everyone in a frenzy. This is educating the world around this next gen AI capabilities, enterprise image and video data. All a big part of it. I mean, the edge of the network mobile world conference is happening right now this, this, this month and it's just ending up. It's just continuing to explode. Video is huge. So <laughs> take us through the company, do a quick explanation of what you guys are doing when you were founded. Uh, talk about what the company's mission is and what's your North Star? Why do you exist? Yeah, RoboFlow exists uh, to really kind of make the world programmable. I like to say make the world be read and write access. Um, and our North Star is enabling developers predominantly to build that future. Um, if you look around, anything that you see will have software related to it and can kind of be turned into software. The limiting reactant though is how to enable computers and machines to understand things as well as people can. And in a lot of ways, computer vision is that missing element that enables anything that you see to become software. So in the virtue of if software is eating the world, um, computer vision kind of makes the aperture infinitely wide is something that I kind of like to, the way I like to frame it. And the capabilities are there, the open source models are there, the amount of data is there, the compute capabilities uh, are only improving annually, but there's a pretty uh, big dearth of tooling uh, and a early but promising sign of the explosion of use cases, models, and data sets that companies, developers, hobbyists alike will need to bring these capabilities to bear. So RoboFlow is in the game of building the community around that capability, building the use cases that allow developers and enterprises to use computer vision, and providing the tooling uh, for companies and developers to be able to add computer vision uh, create better data sets and deploy to production yeah. quickly, easily, safely, um, invaluably. You know, Joseph, the word in production is actually real now. You're seeing a lot more people doing in production activities. That's a real hot one. And usually it's slower, but it's gone faster. And I think that's going to be more of the same. And I think the parallel between what we're seeing on the large language models coming into computer vision. And as you mentioned, Data, video's data, right? I mean, we do a video right now, we're transcribing it into a transcript, linking up to your linguistics, time to the timestamp. I mean, everything's data and that really kind of feeds. So this connection between what we're seeing in the large language model and computer vision are coming together, kind of cousins, brothers. I mean, what's the, how would you compare? How would you explain to someone? Because everyone's like on this wave of watching people bang out their homework assignments and you know, write some hacks on code with, with some of the open AI technologies. There is a corollary directly related to, to the vision side. Can you explain? Yeah, the, uh, the rise of large language models are showing what's possible, uh, especially with text. And I think increasingly we'll get multimodal as with images and video become ingested. Though there's kind of this still uh, core missing um, element of basically like understanding. Um, so the rise of large language models kind of create this new area of generative AI and generative AI in the context of computer vision is a lot of you know creating video and image assets and content. Um, there's also this whole surface area to understanding what's already created, basically digitizing physical um, real world things. I mean, the metaverse can't be built if we don't know how to <laughs> mirror or create or identify uh, the objects that we want to interact with in our everyday lives. And um, where computer vision comes to play and especially what we've seen at RoboFlow is, you know, a little over 100,000 developers now have built with our tools. That's to the tune of 100 million labeled open source images, over 10,000 pre-trained models. And they've kind of showcased to us all of the ways that computer vision is impacting and, and bringing the world um, to life. And these are things that, um, 
you know, even before large language models and generative AI, you had pretty impressive capabilities. And when you add the two together, it actually unlocks these kind of new capabilities. So, so for example, um, you know, one of our um, users actually powers the broadcast feeds at Wimbledon. So here we're talking about video, we're streaming, we're doing things live. We've got folks that are cropping and making sure we look good and audio visual all plugged in correctly. When you broadcast Wimbledon, uh, you'll notice that the camera controllers need to do things like track the ball, which is moving at extremely high speeds and, and zoom, crop, pan, tilt, as well as determine if the ball bounced in or out, the very controversial um, but critical key to a lot of tennis matches. And a lot of that has been historically done with the um, trained uh, but fallible human eye. And computer vision is, uh, you know, well suited for this task to say, how do we uh, track, pan, tilt, zoom, and see, track the tennis ball in real time, run at 30 plus frames per second, and do it all on the edge? And those are capabilities that, you know, were kind of like science fiction, um, maybe even a decade ago, and, and certainly five years ago. Now, the interesting thing is that with the advent of, of generative AI, you can start to do things like create your own training data sets or kind of create logic around once you have this, this visual input. Uh, and teams at Tesla have actually been speaking about, of course, the autopilot team is focused on doing vision tasks, but they've combined large language models to add reasoning and logic. So given that you see, let's say, the tennis ball, what do you want to do? Um, and being able to combine the capabilities of what LLMs represent, which is really a lot of basically core human reasoning and, and logic with computer vision for the inputs of what's possible, creates these uh, new capabilities, let alone multimodality, which I'm sure we'll talk more about. Yeah, I mean, it's really, I mean, it's almost intoxicating. It's amazing that this is so capable because the cloud scales here, you got the edge developing, you can decouple compute power and let Moore's law and all the new silicon and the, the processors and the GPUs do their thing and you got open source booming. You're kind of getting at this next segment I wanted to get into, which is the how people should be thinking about these advances of the computer vision. So this is now a next wave, it's here. I mean, I'd love to have that for baseball because I always like, oh, there should have been a strike. <laughs> um, I'm sure that's going to be coming soon. Um, but what is the computer vision capable of doing today? I guess that's my first question. You hit some of it. Unpack that a little bit. What does generative AI mean in computer vision? What's the new thing? Because there are old technologies been around, proprietary, bolted onto hardware, but hardware advances at a different pace. But now you got new capabilities, generative AI for vision. What does that mean? Yeah, so computer vision, um, you know, at its core is basically enabling machines, computers to understand, process, and act on visual data as effective or more effective than, than people can. Traditionally, this has been, you know, task types like classification, which, you know, identifying if a given image uh, belongs in a certain category of goods on maybe a real retail site, is the shoes or is it clothing? Uh, or object detection, which is, you know, creating bounding boxes, uh, which allows you to do things like count how many things are present or maybe measure the speed of something or trigger an alert when something becomes visible in frame that wasn't previously visible in frame. Or instant segmentation, where you're creating pixel-wise segmentations for both instance and semantic segmentation, where you often see um, these kind of beautiful visuals of the polygons surrounding objects that you see. Um, then you have key point detection, which is where you see, uh, you know, athletes and each of their joints are kind of outlined is another more traditional uh, type problem in um, signal processing and computer vision. With generative AI, you kind of get a whole new class of problem types that, um, are opened up. So in a lot of ways, I think about generative AI in computer vision as some of the you know problems that you aimed to tackle uh, might still be better suited for one of the previous task types we were discussing. Some of those problem types may be better suited for using a generative technique. And some are problem types that just previously wouldn't have been possible absent generative AI. And so if you make that kind of Venn diagram in your head, you can think about, okay, um, you know, visual question answering is a task type where if I give you an image and I say, you know, how many people are in this image? We could either build an object detection model that might count all those people, or maybe a visual question answering system would sufficiently answer uh, this type of problem. Um, let alone generative AI being able to create new training data for old systems. And that's something that we've seen be an increasingly prominent uh, use case for our users, uh, as much as things that we advise 
our customers and um, the community writ large to take advantage of. So ultimately, those are kind of the traditional task types. I can give you some insight maybe um, into how I think about what's possible today or five years or 10 years yeah, as you sort of definitely. Suggest. Let's get into that, that vision. So I kind of think about the types of use cases in terms of what's possible. Um, if you just imagine a, a very simple bell curve, your normal distribution. For the longest time, um, the types of things that are in the center of that bell curve are identifying objects that are very common or common objects in context. Microsoft published the Cocoa data set in 2014 of common objects in context of hundreds of thousands of images um, of chairs, forks, food, person, um, these sorts of things. And, um, you know, the challenge of the day had always been, how do you identify just those 80 objects? So if we think about the bell curve, that'd be maybe the like dead center of the curve where there's a lot of those objects present um, and it's a very common thing that needs to be identified, but it's a very, very, very small sliver of the distribution. Now, if you go out to the way long tail, let's go like deep into the tail of this, this imagined visual normal distribution. You're going to have a problem like one of our customers, Rivian, in, in tandem with uh, AWS, is tackling to do um, visual quality assurance and manufacturing and production processes. Now, only Rivian knows what a Rivian is supposed to look like. Only they know the imagery of what uh, their goods that are going to be produced are. And then between those long tails of proprietary data of highly specific things that need to be understood, in the center of the curve, you have a whole kind of messy middle type of problems, I like to say. The way I think about computer vision advancing is it's basically you have larger and larger and more capable models that eat from the center out, right? So if you have a model that um, you know understands the 80 classes in Coco, well, pretty soon you have advances like Clip, um, uh, which was trained on 400 million image text pairs and has a greater understanding of a wider array of objects uh, than just 80 classes in context. And over time, you'll get more and more of these larger models that kind of eat uh, outwards from that center of the distribution. And so the question becomes for companies, um, when can you rely on maybe a model that just already exists? Uh, how do you use your data to get what may be capable off the shelf, so to speak, into something that is usable for you? Or if you're, if you're in those long tails and you have proprietary data, how do you take advantage of the greatest asset you have, which is observed visual information that you want to put to work for your customers. And you're kind of living in the long tails and you need to adapt state of the art for your capabilities. So my mental model for like how computer vision advances is you have that bell curve and you have increasingly powerful models that eat outward and multimodality has a role to play in that. Larger models have a role to play in that. Uh, more compute, more data generally has a role to play in that. Um, but it will be a messy and I yeah. think um, <laughs> long condition. Well, the thing I want to get, first of all, it's great, great uh, mental model. I appreciate that because I think that makes a lot of sense. The question is, it seems now more than ever with the scale and compute that's available, that not only can you eat out to the middle in your example, but there's other models you can integrate with. In the past, they were siloed, static, almost bespoke. Now you're looking at larger models eating into the bell curve, as you said, but also integrating in with other stuff. So this seems to be part of the that interaction. How does first of all, do you is that really happening? Is that true? And then two, what does that mean for companies who want to take advantage of this? Because the old model was operational. You know, I have my my cameras, they're watching stuff, whatever. And like now you're in this more of a distributed computing, computer science mindset, not you know put the camera on the wall kind of. I'm oversimplifying, but you know what I'm saying. What what what's your take on that? The, um, well, to the, to the first point of uh, how are these advances happening, what I was kind of describing was, you know, uh, almost unidimensional in that you have like, you're only thinking about vision, but the rise of generative techniques and multimodality, like Clip is a multimodal model. It has 400 million image text pairs. Um, that will advance the generalizability at a faster rate than just treating everything as only vision. And that's kind of where LLMs and vision will intersect in a really nice and powerful way. Now, in terms of like companies, how should they be thinking about taking advantage of these trends? The uh, biggest thing that, and I, I think it's, it's different obviously on the size of business, if you're an enterprise versus a startup. The biggest thing that I think if you're an enterprise and you have an established scaled business model um, that is working for your customers, the question becomes, how do you take advantage of that established uh, data moat potentially, uh, resource moats, 
uh, and certainly, of course, established way of providing value to an end uh, end user. So, for example, one of our customers, Walmart, has the advantage of one of the largest uh, inventory and, and um, stock of any company in the world. And they also, of course, have substantial visual data, both from like their online catalogs or understanding what's uh, in stock or out of stock or understanding um you know, the quality of things as they're re- going from the start of their supply chain to making it inside stores mm-hmm. um, for delivery of fulfillments. Um, all of these are, are visual challenges. Now, they already have a substantial trove of useful imagery to understand and teach and train um, large models to understand um, each of the individual SKUs and products that are in their stores. And so if I'm a Walmart, what I'm thinking is, how do I make sure that my petabytes of visual information is utilized in a way where I capture the proprietary benefits of the models that I can train to do tasks like what item was this? Or maybe I want to create Amazon Go-like technology, or maybe I want to build like delivery robots, or I want to automatically know what's in and out of stock from uh, visual input feeds that I have across my uh, in-store uh, traffic. Um, and that becomes the question and flavor of the day for, for enterprises. I've got this large amount of data. I've got an established way that I can provide more value to my end customers. How do I ensure I take advantage of the data advantage uh, I'm already sitting on? Yeah. If you're a startup, I think it's a pretty different question. Um, and I'm happy to talk about- Yeah, what's the startup um, angle on this? Because you know, there's, they're going to want to take advantage. It's like cloud startups, cloud native startups. They were born in the cloud. They, they never had an IT department. So if you're a startup, is there a similar role here? And if I'm a computer vision startup, what's that mean? So can you share your, your take on that? Because there'll be a lot of people starting up from this. So startups have the opposite advantage and, and, and disadvantage, right? <laughs> like a, a startup doesn't have an, a proven way of delivering repeatable uh, value in the same way that a scaled enterprise does. But it does have the uh, nimbleness to identify uh, and take advantage of techniques that you can start from a blank slate. Um, and I think the thing that startups need to be wary of in the generative AI and large language model um, and multimodal uh, world is building what I like to call um, uh, kind of like sandcastles. Uh, a sandcastle is maybe a business model or a capability that's built on top of an assumption that is uh, going to be pretty, pretty quickly wiped away by improving underlying model technology. So almost like if you imagine like the ocean, the waves are coming in and, and they're going to wipe away your, your progress. You don't want to be in the position of building a, a sandcastle business where um, a, you don't want to bet on the fact that models aren't going to get um, uh, good enough to solve the task type that you might be solving. In other words, don't take a screenshot of what's capable today. Assume that what's capable today is only going to continue to uh, become possible. And so for a startup, what you can do that like enterprises are quite um, comparatively less good at is embedding these capabilities deeply within your products and delivering maybe a vertical based experience uh, where AI kind of exists in the background. Yeah. And we might not think of companies as, you know, even AI companies, it's just so embedded in the experience they provide. Um, but that's like the vertical application example of taking AI and making it be immediately usable. Or of course, there's tons of picks and shovels businesses to be built like RoboFlow, where you're enabling these enterprises to take advantage of something that they have, whether that's their data sets, their computes, or their, their intellect. Um, so, okay, I so, the, so if I hear that right, by the way, I love that's horizontally scalable, that's the large language models. Go up right. and build them the apps, hence your developer focus. I'm sure that's probably the reason that the tsunami of developer is action. So you're saying picks and shovels tools, don't try to replicate the platform of what could be the platform play. Oh, go to a VC, I'm going to build the platform. No, 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 no. Those are going to get wiped away by the large language models. Um, is there one large think, language model that will rule the world or do you see many coming? Yeah, so, so to be clear, I think there will be useful platforms. I just think a lot of people think that they're building, let's say, um, you know, if we put this in the cloud context, you're building a specific type of EC2 instance uh, well, it turns out that Amazon can offer that type of EC2 instance and immediately distribute it to all of their customers. So you don't want to be in the position of just uh, providing something that actually ends up looking like a feature, um, which in the context of AI might be like a small incremental improvement on the model. If that's all you're doing, you're a sandcastle business. Now, there's a lot of platform businesses that need to be built that enable businesses to get to value 
and do things like, how do I monitor my models? How do I create better models with my given data sets? How do I ensure that my models are doing what I want them to do? How do I find the right models to use? There's all these sorts of platform wide problems that certainly exist for businesses. I just think a lot of startups that I'm seeing right now are um, making the mistake of assuming the advances we're seeing are not going to accelerate or even get better. So um, if, if I'm a customer, if I'm a, I'm a company, say I'm a startup or an enterprise, either one, same, same question. And I want to stand up and I have developers working on stuff. I want to start standing up an environment to start doing stuff. Is that a service provider? Is that a managed service? Is that you guys? So how do you guys fit into the, the, the your customers leaning in? Is it just for developers? Or are you targeting with a specific like managed service? What's the product consumption? How do you talk to customers when, when they come to you? The, uh, the thing that we do is in the, we give developers superpowers to build um, automated inventory tracking, uh, self-checkout systems, uh, identify if this image is uh, malignant cancer or benign cancer, um, ensure that these products that I've produced are correct, um, make sure that the defect that might exist on this electric vehicle is, is um, uh, makes its way back for review. All these sorts of problems are immediately able to be solved and, and tackled in terms of the uh, managed services element, we have solutions and integrators that will often build on top of our tools, or we'll have companies that look to us for guidance, but ultimately the company is in control of developing and building and creating these capabilities in-house. I really think the distinction is maybe less around managed service and tool and more about uh, ownership in the era of AI. So for example, um, if I'm using a managed service um, and that managed service, part of their benefit is that they are uh, learning across their customer sets. Uh, that's a very different relationship than using a managed service where I'm developing some amount of proprietary advantages for my data sets. Um, and I think that's a really important thing that companies are becoming attuned to, which is the value of the data that they have. And so that's what we do. We say, we tell companies that you have this proprietary immense uh, treasure trove of, of data, use that to your advantage uh, and think of us more like a set of tools that enable you to get value from that capability. You know, um, the Hashi Corps and GitLabs of the world have proven like what these businesses look like at scale. Um, and you're targeting developers. When you go into a company saying, you're targeting developers with freemium, is there a paid service? Talk about the business model real quick. Sure, yeah, the um, tools are free to use and get started. Um, the there's. When someone signs up for RoboFlow, they may elect to make their work open source, in which case uh, we're able to provide even more generous uh, usage limits to basically move the computer vision community forward. Um, if you elect to make your data private, uh, you can use our hosted uh, data set managing, data set training, model deployment, annotation tooling, uh, up to some limits. And then usually when someone validates that what they're doing gets them value, they purchase a subscription license to be able to uh, scale up those capabilities. Awesome. Um, so like most developer centric products, it's free to get started, free to prove, free to poke around, develop what uh, you think is, is possible. And then once you're getting to value, uh, then we're able to capture the commercial upside and the value that's being provided. Love the business model. It's right in line with where the market is. There's kind of really no standards bodies these days. The developers are the ones who are deciding kind of what the standards are by their adoption. I think making that easy for developers to get value uh, is the model open source is continuing to grow. You can see more of that. Great, great perspective, Joseph. Thanks for sharing that. Put a plug in for the company. What are you guys doing right now? Where are you in your growth? What are you looking for? How should people engage? Give the quick uh, uh, commercial for the company. So as I mentioned, RoboFlow is, um, I think one of the largest, if not the largest collections of computer vision models and data sets that are open source available on the web today and have a private set of tools that over half the Fortune 100 now um, rely on those tools. So we're at the stage now where we know people want what we're working on and we're continuing to drive that type of adoption. So um, companies that are looking to make better models, improve their data sets, train and deploy, um, often we'll get a lot of value from our tools and certainly reach out to talk. I'm sure there's a lot of talented engineers that are tuning in too. Uh, we're aggressively hiring. Uh, so if you are interested in being a part of making the world programmable and being at the ground floor of the company that's creating these capabilities to be writ large, we'd love to hear from you. Amazing, Joseph, thanks so much for coming on and being part of the AWS Startup Showcase. 
Man, if I was in my 20s, I'd be knocking on your door because it's the hottest trend right now. It's super exciting. Uh, Generative AI is just at the beginning of massive sea change. Congratulations on all your success and we'll be following what you guys do. Thanks for, for spending the time, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Okay, this is season three, episode one of the ongoing series covering the exciting startups from the ADOS ecosystem, talking about the hottest things in tech. I'm John Furrier, your host. Thanks for watching. Thank you.